It feels like it feels like there's a lot of play in the Yeah. yeah. That comes with it. That's free. Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> What I, what I see, you know, I, I mean, I don't know nothing about this. What I notice is that when I got off the gas and even on the brake, pull the car to the left and jerk the side. That's, that's probably because you only have a left front brake. That's why I just told him he needs to hook the right yeah. front brake up. I think up. if we hook the both up when I got in the nose down. Because you should be able to use quite a bit of brake. Not, not real hard, but just gradually beat into it. became the youngest driver ever awarded a USAC Sprint car license. And he was driving a Raleigh Hemley car. One of the, the most prestigious midget races on the USAC National Championship Series is the night before the 500. It's held at Indianapolis Raceway Park the night before the Indianapolis 500. That was Jeff's first race in 1989. So we were a little doubtful what we were, how we were going to do. We knew we'd do well. We had a brand new car. Jeff in qualifying went out and broke the track record and then proceeded to just run away with the race. Jeff Gordon's dedication began paying off. He started noticing that with the wins and the prize money came a measure of fame. He really doesn't think that he's, um, you know, any kind of a big important person. He, he doesn't think of himself as a Dale Earnhardt or a or uh, Richard Caddy or anything like that. He's, and, and I'm constantly telling him my favorite saying to him is you're just a little fish in a great big ocean. I want to be a racer, you know. I want to go out and I want to win races and, and uh, I want to be successful and, and still be racing and being as successful as I've been so far. But um, they believed in me and they believed in themselves. And, and uh, I tell you, they've, they've done a world for me and, and, and have made me what I am today, not just as a race car driver, but as a person. We have a unique situation. Jeff has a mom that's probably the biggest driving force um, in his whole career and probably my greatest motivation to continue motivating or helping Jeff. He creates his own motivation. If you Once you meet Jeff and you go to the race with him, his constant, relentless desire to succeed draws the best out of everybody. He says, I motivated him. He motivated me. His mom motivated both of us. Jeff's special relationship with his stepdad is seen in every aspect of his racing career, from building cars to dealing with the sponsors. John is the one person he feels he can always turn to. That's so much common sense, and, and, and he's taught me so much, and he made me work on those cars, and he, you know, he made me learn. You know, he had helped me go out and talk. Starting in third position is the defending champion of this race, young Jeff Gordon. Now, this guy is a name to be reckoned with. At the tender age of 19, he won this race. He won the Silver Crown Series Point Championship last year, and he also ran full-time on NASCAR's Bush Grand National Circuit, in which he was Rookie of the Year. What's left, Jeff? Um, hopefully to win this race. You know, we just kind of go on to the next race and uh, uh, hope for the best. But right now we're running good, start up front. And uh, we just hope for a good, clean race and uh, hope that we end up in the winner's circle again. Well, this is kind of back to the roots of your racing. These are the kind of cars that, that, that you grew up with, in, these and the midgets. 
Oh, yeah, you know, I, I love the midgets. I love the sprint cars, the silver crown cars, and they've all been really good to me. USAC's been good to me, and, and Phoenix International Raceway has been good to me. So uh, we got a lot of good things going for us, and, and like I said, we just want to end up in that winner's circle. Well, this is going to be your only appearance in the Silver Crown Series this year, so you want to make the best of it. Oh, definitely. You know, I, I really love the, the open wheel cars, and I just don't get to run enough. But, you know, right now we want to win the Bush Grand National Championship. We've got Baby Ruth, as you can see, I'm wearing all the apparel. And, and uh, we just really want to make it a good run for them this year. And, and uh, I think the only way we're going to be able to do that is to fully concentrate on the Bush Grand National Circuit and leave the open wheel stuff behind. For a little more on this field, back to... The engines are fired. 30 Silver Crown single seaters rolling down pit lane here at Phoenix International Raceway. All powered by either 355 cubic inch alcohol burning Chevy V8s or smaller Chevy V6s with a weight advantage. But either way, difficult race cars to drive, Steve. No, it's interesting, Brock. Uh, you talked to Jeff Gordon, who we find inside the second row. When he was born, these cars were already old racing machines. That's true. That's true. As I said, uh, when I was talking to Pancrax, uh, these cars uh, are really original versions of the cars that raced in Indianapolis up until about 19, uh, the middle 50s when the Roadsters replaced them. They were uh, specially built for uh, Indianapolis and other paved ovals, and then, of course, the mid-engine, rear-engine cars took over. These cars kind of got eased aside for a while, kind of fell out of style. Then came back after USAC recreated the Silver Crown Series, and they run, uh, as I said, both on the dirt miles and occasionally on the big asphalt ovals like Phoenix. In fact, this is the only asphalt race they'll run this year, and it kicks off their season. Uh, we see a couple of uh, Indianapolis drivers, Johnny Parsons Jr., Larry Dixon. Uh, a lot of these guys have been to the Speedway. Well, no matter their age or experience, they all agree on one thing, and that's the emphasis on safety. Earlier, I had a look. Driving one of these silver crown cars is akin to uh, bungee jumping and bullfighting when it comes to manly pursuits. But just because these drivers are brave, don't think they're foolhardy when it comes to their personal safety. This is the car driven by 20-year-old Jeff Gordon, who won here a year ago. Now, Jeff is one of the first to go to this netting, kind of like a window net on a stock car, which he also drives. His partner, Jimmy Sills, has them on both sides, Jeff just on the right side of the automobile. Now, the seat, unlike the old very rigid racing seats, this one is built to give and heavily padded. He said he's hit the wall very hard hard and not even bruised a rib. Now there's not just a shoulder harness, not just seat belts, but also this fifth crotch strap to keep the driver from sliding down into the seat. Now in the newer silver crown cars, there's been some improvement in roll bar technology. These are called down tube chassis. See this tube going all the way to the front of the car? It gives the car a lot more rigidity, makes a roll bar a lot stronger, and just a little bit wider. And one, over th one other thing, if we can come in here. See this little lip right here? The wind on this high-speed mile track was so strong, it was actually trying to tear his helmet off. They added this to deflect it over. But as Jeff told me in our conversation just a few moments ago, the biggest safety factor in one of these cars is sitting right on your shoulders. It's called concentration all the time. Well, there's your leader, Steve Butler, coming down into turn number three. Right behind him, Dotsinger. Bliss made a charge. Well, for a young man like uh, Jeff Gordon, uh, the future is uh, seemingly lying to the south where uh, uh, Winston Cup cars, really the technology in those cars are a lot more similar than uh, jumping into a rear engine car at the Speedway. These are front engine cars, basically understeering automobiles, much like a stock car, even though they don't look alike. But it's easier to make the move from here up down there than it is to go to an Indianapolis car where the technology and the uh, chassis tuning is totally different. All right, we're looking at the number 30 car, Chuck Gurney. He's battling Jimmy Sills for that fifth position. That's Gurney in the black car. 50 Indianapolis 500, but I don't think Johnny Parsons Jr. is going to go to the distance today. Lost an engine. We're looking at Jeff Gordon currently in fourth. He started third, so his progress has been to the rear so far for the defending champion here at the Silver Crown Race in Phoenix. Yeah, I got to correct myself here. I said most of them were uh, uh, big Chevy V8s, but there are a few GM V6s in this. to the car my dad's always told me you know you win a race by preparation on a wednesday not on a saturday or a sunday the day of the race you know you, and uh, i've always i've always believed in that because that was what it always worked jeff's stepfather john bickford is one of the uh, most intense one of the most intelligent men that i've ever met in in racing 
and he instilled in Jeff at a very early age that he had to understand the car. He had to be able to work on the car. He had to be to relate to the crew what the car was doing and then let them fix it. And he is, does a great job at that. Any minor change we make, he understands. He understands how the car reacts to it. And I think that's going to be a big part of his success down here. Did you ever think your career would grow this fast? No way, no way. Uh, it, it's amazing how, how far it's come in the last year, in the last two or three years. Uh, you know, I just thought I was going to be a kid racing midgets and sprint cars for the rest of my life. And, and uh, you know, I, I just, you, I guess it happened so fast and everything was going so well. And, you know, I don't want to... One of the things that all successful professional athletes have done is dedicate themselves to a specific area to try to be the best that they can be. The Bush Grand National Division begins its second decade and ESPN is proud to be part as we begin our second decade of excellence. In the past, it was considered a stepping stone series, but now the Grand National Division stands on its own. It's seen the best drivers join its ranks, drivers like Dale Earnhardt and Neil Bonnet. Ten years ago, Earnhardt drove to victory, the first of 17 in this series. Second that day was Jody Ridley, now a four-time and defending Winston All-Pro champ. Third was Sam Ard, a regular who went on to win the series title the next two years. Today's Grand National Series will see occasional Winston Cup competitors, but it also has stars of its own, like Tommy Houston, who hasn't missed a single event in the last decade. And nine-time winner Jimmy Hensley, third on the all-time starts list. The future of this division looks bright, with 27-year-old Bobby Labonte and 20-year-old Jeff Gordon. Also young Joe Nemechek, who's earned the outside front row spot for today's Goodies 300. ESPN Speed World on hand today at Daytona International Speedway for the Goodies 300 Bush Grand National Race. And here is today's Sears Die Hard starting lineup. The pole sitter is Michael Waltrip. In the Pennzoil Pontiac number 30, speed 186.5, two miles an hour slower than last year's pole. Joe Nemechek is outside to number 87, the Texas Peach Chevrolet. The second row, number 36, the Durapine by Cox Pontiac, driven by Kenny Wallace. Outside is a GM Goodwin Chevrolet number 3, driven by Dale Earnhardt. Starting fifth, Daryl Waltrip, the Western Auto Chevrolet number 17, and the Gwaltney's Big 8 Chevrolet number 27, handled by Ward Burton from Boston, Virginia. In the fourth row, tomorrow's front row for the Daytona 500, Sterling Marlin in car number 10 and Bill Elliott in number 11. The fifth row, Ernie Irvin in car number 4 and Tracy Leslie in 72. The sixth row consists of Ken Schrader, number 15, and Jack Sprague in number 48. Ricky Craven will start in 13th position, and fellow Bush Grand National North competitor Joe Vesey is alongside the 8th row Rick Mast and Steve Grissom. In the 9th row for today's race, Jimmy Spencer and Jeff Burton. And as we look at the rest of the starting lineup again, Benny, it was a very tough field to get into. Awfully tough field. Harry Gant, Tommy Ellis, couple of longtime competitors in Bush Grand National, did not, not make the show. And Bob, both those drivers tried to qualify Buick, so it looks like that body style, body style just doesn't like the speed. And some pretty good names back here in the back of the field. Hut Strickland and Mike Wallace go from row number 19. And the drivers who had to take provisionals, Tommy Houston, Jeff Berry, Tom Peck, and the, the uh, rookie of the year last year, Jeff Gordon. The cars that are on the lead lap did pit during that caution, and one of the cars up in this lead group now is Jeff Gordon, the 1991 Bush Grand National Champion, who began this race from last. Bush Grand National Rookie of the Year, not champion. Oh, oh sorry. Look at this. Look at this. Jimmy Careful, Sp boy. <laughs> Spencer going around Chuck Bound. Ooh, that guy on the outside. I don't know who that was. I just saw it briefly, but he got himself a little bit of a jam. 
Bush Grand National cars. And so if I, if I say sportsman today, I mean Bush Grand National. There is also a sportsman division in NASCAR division. We're not running them today. Chevrolet, they head down pit road. Warburton's crew servicing that car. Ernie Irvin is leading as well. So for many of these drivers, it was a final pit stop, guys. They just hop off the tank, no tire change, and they're away. led most laps. He has had his rear view mirror full all afternoon as Darrell Waltrip hangs in there in eighth position. Up ahead is Jeff Gordon in seventh. And he has closed in on the back bumper of Jeff Gordon. To get that draft. Two cars side to side, Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Spencer. Gordon in the white, number one, and Spencer goes up the racetrack. Ooh. Taking Jeff high in turn four, and that's Bill Elliott right behind, and Darrell Waltrip here as we have the shot from the roof camp. There's Elliott on the right. The black and white zero is Rick Mass. I think we superstar Jeff Gordon uh, who started last and worked his way up to the top 10 is out of the race the engine apparently let go on the baby Ruth Ford and Jeff Gordon dropped out of competition Among the stories that unfolded here prior to the Goodwrench 200, Kenny Wallace debuted his new Dirt Devil car. He's teaming with car owner Felix Sabatis here in 1992. And on the pole for this race, 1991 Bush Grand National Rookie of the Year, Jeff Gordon. Jeff still looking for that elusive first victory. Could it come here today? I sure hope so. Things are really going good for us this weekend. And, uh, you know, the pole was just one step, but uh, we got another step to conquer, and that's winning this sucker. But I tell you, it, as well as it's going, I think we can do it. Gordon took the green flag and led the first 21 laps of the 197 lap demolition derby. The 36 car field included Winston Cup regulars Dale Earnhardt, who took the lead on lap 22, and Bill Elliott, who took it back to the garage on lap 62. The battle for second was between Labonte and sprint car veteran Gordon, who showed signs of his dirt track skills when he held on to his sliding number one. He's already reached some of them, and he has enough time to accomplish the rest. Young he may be, but no one thinks of Jeff Gordon as a kid. They think of him as the professional racer he is. All the drivers that win, all the drivers that have been successful, I, I've wanted a pattern after that. You know, I wanted to go out and win and do my best. And, and um, I, I felt like I was in a different category all the time because I was always the young guy. I was always um, the kid. Come true. It's something that I never even imagined happening probably come down to the experience versus the inexperience for the bush drivers. Everybody was saying, well, obviously a Winston Cup guy is going to win because they know the racetrack. Did you have that in your mind when you started the race? Well, experience is usually what wins a race. And so a track that Bush Grand National uh, drivers haven't been to before, it was definitely looking up to the Winston Cup drivers. Green flag is in the air and on the break, Jeff Gordon will take off, gets a good start. The incident where you ran out of fuel and then caught the caution was the key moment. I thought our perfect day was coming to a quick end there. And there's trouble for the leader in turn two. The car is slow coming down the back straight away. They think he's ran out of gas. We got the break of our lifetime because when we did run out of fuel, someone blew a motor and caused a yellow and we coasted around and all we had to do was go to the tail end. We didn't lose a lap. Jeff Gordon trying to work his way back up to the front. The guys on the radio kept saying it was, be calm, be calm, we'll get there, don't worry. And we did, we just picked him off slowly but surely and we were right back up front again. Gordon's there right down the inside of Dale Jarrett. Now he will flash by Jeff Gordon, the pole sitter, back out in front.
I almost choked up one time. I said, man, keep our fingers crossed. Please let us get this one. In only his 35th start, Jeff Gordon takes the checkered flag and wins the Atlanta 300. This is a very, very big win for us. And I got to thank our new guy, Ray Everton. He, he's really been a key factor to our program. And I couldn't do it without Bill Davis. He's everything. I'll never want this day to end. I want to stay in victory circle all day long. It was an incredible day. Who knows what's in store for the future. races you'll ever see. We're going to wear the track out to the tires today. Ricky Craven's back in the race. Can you Spencer lapping past him there? And Jeff Gordon's in trouble. A lot of smoke from the baby Ruth car. Rear end now? Yeah, it looks like it's coming out of the rear of the car. Still under power. Looks like he's putting a lot of grease down. It's going to be hard to tell if there's any slicker or not, but looks like he might be putting a little bit of oil down on the edge of the track. He's off the track down in turn two, down to the inside and will not be able to limp that car around back to pit road caution is out gordon's car is parked in turn two right at the bottom of the racetrack so they'll have to put the caution out there's gordon's car in a precarious spot should anybody spin about a turn number two well you've heard of the skins game in golf how about the fins game Right after today's Mountain Dew 500, stay tuned for all the excitement. When Pro Live, so you're right, Neil, just 30, 35 laps in between, uh, we've been able to get some green flag racing in. Um, let's have a look at what happened at Jeff Gordon's car. We speculated rear end, and uh, that was not quite correct. Mike here, he's coming up off the second turn down the back straightaway. He's going down the back straightaway. He's fixing to enter the corner, and watch the back end of the car kick out as he goes down in the corner. He's driving down on the inside right now. And then the tire blows. See the car jump right there. He ran over some of that debris or something. It blew a rear tire. The car lifted off the ground, and that's the right rear tire smoking real bad. And he just had to really slow down and almost got hit. But it's uh, the right rear tire is all the way down on the rear. Did a nice job of controlling that car. Mm -hmm. Yep. He's done for the day with that car. But, Mike, that, those rocks, these, are, these tires are two-ply tires. And they come brand spanking new slicks with just five thirty seconds of rubber on them which is about a third what a street tire has on them, and they just cannot run with those rocks or pebbles because it'll go straight through it in just one. He turned down the corner just lost the tire immediately. Now here's the sweeper out working turns three and four again. There's, uh, there's a look at Presley's car, and you see just a little bit of water dribbling down there. And, Neil, that's not just due to because it's being so warm today. Mike, when this track's tearing up like this, we're seeing the big rocks and pebbles on the track. We're not seeing the grinding dust and the sand and stuff, and it just crams back in these radiators. And these guys, are got the whole front area of these cars are plugged up now. We used to plug a car up to qualify, but these guys are racing with them full of trash. And the next step is going to be burning some motors down. Well, the fellow who brought out the caution flag that led to this red flag is back behind the wall with Glenn Jerry. Glenn? Well, we're standing by with Jeff Gordon. Jeff, one of those guys slipping and sliding out there. What happened to the car? Well, they said it broke the front of the crankshaft off. Why? And, you know, when it did it, all I know is I was going into three, and uh, motor quit and something clunked underneath the car, ran over the top of whatever, the pulley that, that fell off. And it's unfortunate because the Baby Ruth Thunderbird was running good. As bad as the track conditions were, today is one of those survival days. You try to get in line and, and just ride it out and get some points. And fortunately, we were running in seventh position. So, uh, you know, things were going well for us as bad as the track conditions were, but it's just too unfortunate. Well, there's something in Jeff's car. If we can get the camera on it, I want to show it. There's a tape to the roll bar there's a sign that says harry gant what's that all about well harry gant's been winning a lot of races and and one of the reasons is because he's very patient and he really knows how to uh to um keep the, his equipment under the tires without burning them off and, and brakes and stuff like that so uh the guys all thought that'd be pretty good if they put harry gant on there and, and just as a little reminder to me to, to be patient he's got a lot of time to be patient now mike well, he was pretty patient coming to the front, Glenn. He started 21st, and as you reported, he was running 7th when the car let go. You know, in, in basketball, everybody wants to be like Michael Jordan. Does I want to be like Mike commercials? I think here everybody wants to be like, they're just wild about Harry. I tell you what, Mike, that's a pretty impressive name on top of his race car anyway. Jeff Gordon, he's quite a racer. And you talk about somebody with a future ahead of him at his age and the, the things he's accomplished now. He's going to be dealing with this racing for a long time. That's tremendous.
Jeff Gordon has been called the future of auto racing. For a while at the end of his first season, it looked like the future would involve a Winston Cup ride. He was offered one after just one season on the Bush Grand National Circuit. Most racers his age would have jumped at the chance. Jeff turned it down. Listen. I tell you, it was it was a, a difficult time for me because uh, you know things were going good with with Bush Grand National and and I didn't want to go away from Bush Grand National. I wanted to you know I wanted to stick with Bill Davis. I wanted to keep uh, everything going the way it was going because it was going so good. But then when you get offered a Winston Cup ride and and uh, you know that everything you're working for is to get to Winston Cup, and all of a sudden you're offered a Winston Cup ride, and you're saying, boy, if I if I don't take this. How do I know if, if, if I'm going to be offered a, another Winston Cup ride? Well, he called me and asked me to come down and meet with him and uh, Cale Yarbrough, who had extended an offer to him. And we looked the whole package that Cale had to offer over, and we looked at where Jeff was at current time in Bush Grand National. We spoke to other drivers, uh, Dale Earnhardt, Kenny Schrader. Uh, we listened to the advice of Bill Davis, the car owner he was driving for, and I was suggesting to Jeff that we talk to all these people, that we look and we listen to what everybody had to say, and I said, then you go to bed, you make a decision, you tell me what that is, and uh, I'll back you 100%. He could have handled it. He could have stepped into that car and, and, and probably handled it real well, but there was not a need for that. Uh, he's got plenty of time. He was... Uh, I guess he was only 19 at the time, he's only 20 now, and his career has been structured and there's no need for him to get in a hurry. It wasn't the right time for me, I think um, that I, I know how much I learned in my first year with Bush and how much more that I've got to learn and how much more I need to learn before I even make that step to Winston Cup. That's a, a major step, and, and I don't want to take it too soon, and, and I want it to be the right time, and I want good things to come out. I think down the road, I'm going to have a lot of experience and still be one of the younger guys. Uh, you know, when I'm 30 years old, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of experience, and, and I hope that uh, that just means uh, uh, a lot of success and for, for uh, a number of years, and I uh, hope I can be winning races when I'm 51 like Harry can. <laughs> Just in case you're keeping track, Jeff Gordon won't be 51 until the year 2022. Hey, I can't even count high enough to figure how old I'll be in 2022. Now, y'all come back next week while I'm still the young, exciting, and dashing Neil Bonnet. Y'all take care. Johnny Rumley showed the packed house he knew the track from running in the late model stocks and he could handle the wheel. The challengers chasing the 25 included Jeff Burton and Jeff Gordon and outside pole sitter Chuck Bound. And this young fellow who's had such a great season uh, this year and won Rookie of the Year last year for Bill Davis is packing his bags. At the end of the season, he will join Rick Hendrick's operation out of Charlotte, North Carolina, in a third Hendrick Chevrolet Winston Cup team, a brand new team being built from the ground up specifically for Jeff Gordon. And I got comments from both Jeff and from car owner Bill Davis, who feels heartsick over this and, uh, and felt like he was struck by lightning when the news hit, uh, because Gordon made the decision uh, without consulting either Davis or Ford Motor Company or his present sponsors. First, let's get uh, Jeff Gordon's uh, comments. Um, you know, I just, it, it was the toughest decision I've ever had to make, and, and, and you know, I, I'm still trying to, trying to, you know, really, I mean, I'm going Winston Cup next year, and I think that's great, and it's a, it's a, a really good opportunity for me. All of these guys on this team, you know, there must be 15 guys, and they've all sacrificed financially and emotionally and, and everything else because we had a dream, and, and, and we were on target. It was going real well for us. Bill Davis and myself have a, a 
re, we've gotten a, a very good relationship throughout the, the last two years or year and a half. And the last thing I wanted to do w was leave him and leave Ford. You know, I feel real sorry for Lee Morris and Michael Cranifus. They put as much effort, financial and, and emotional effort, into Jeff Gordon's development as I did. And, and uh, they've been kicked in the teeth just as hard as I have. Well, it really didn't have anything to do with Ford, anything to do with Chevrolet. Ford has get, given me so many opportunities to get involved in, in, in NASCAR and, and where I want to be. And, and it had nothing to do with them. They, they've treated me very, very good. And maybe somewhere down the road, our, cross, our, our pass will meet again. It was going real well for us. Uh, we've made tremendous progress. And and they've all pulled together and worked real hard and and for suddenly uh that wasn't that wasn't where he wanted to be and 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 you know i think we've done the job for him and sure it's going to be hard for them to come back and and work as hard as they have one of the ironies of this situation is that ford bill davis racing and a major national sponsor were about to uh, announce a multi-year deal to go winston cup racing with jeff gordon as driver and suddenly that door, that door slammed shut. Mike, you know, when you sat around the garage yesterday, it rained all day, and I walked through the garage area, and there's rumblings, hey, is this really going to happen? You know, everybody's question, is it true? And then, you know, the story was broken, and, and it is a, uh, a true deal that they are going to split up and everything. And you can almost sense it in Jeff Gordon and everybody involved, is this really going to happen? I, I don't know that if he's second-guessing or what, but, I mean, it had to be a big decision for this young man. He had a bright future ahead of him and had a lot of people in his corner, and now he's uh, going to the Hendricks, which is a good organization, too, but I'm so sure it was a big, uh, big challenge for him. I'm sure it was. The majority consensus in the garage area here is that Jeff Gordon is stepping out of one of the best situations any driver has in this sport. So certainly to do so, he must see the promise of, of something better long term down the road. And Bill Davis Racing will continue to be a force to be reckoned with here in the Bush Series and likely next year in the Winston Cup ranks with Ford backing. So uh, there will be some other fallout from